Now, why do we need boundaries, you say? But let me tell you, if you're in a church and a pastor commits adultery and it becomes known, you say he's disqualified as a pastor. There's a moral boundary. If you're in a church and the pastor says, I don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, I don't believe in the deity of Christ, you say you can't be a pastor in our church. There's a doctrinal boundary. So all evangelical groups and all evangelical churches have some doctrinal and moral boundaries. Okay? And sometimes people say, well, we just believe the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed says nothing about adultery. Okay? So we have different boundaries sometimes, too. And it doesn't, yes, it says the resurrection. It says, the, okay, the resurrection and deity are in the creeds, but um, justification by faith alone is not in the Apostles or Nicene Creed. So we are always faced with the question, how do we draw the proper, how do we use wise judgment to draw the proper boundaries, not about visitors, anyone can visit, but who can be a leader? who can have an elder responsibility in a church, who can be the pastor, or who can be the board of directors of a parachurch organization. It's at the leadership level that boundaries are mostly important. So, <clears throat> we start out, what kinds of groups and what kinds of boundaries, I've been talking about this. I mean churches, but I mean publication houses, mission boards, Christian schools, mission agencies, all sorts of organizations. And what kind of boundaries? It's how you decide whether someone is suitable for leadership. Why should Christian organizations draw boundaries at all? Well, well, the New Testament says that false teaching harms the church. Paul spent three years in Ephesus. It was the longest of his stay at any city, and he was regularly teaching in Ephesus. But then he left Ephesus and continued on his missionary journeys, and then on the way to Rome, he stopped in Miletus and called for the elders of the church at Ephesus, and they came to him, and he said, I know that after my departure, Fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Fierce wolves. Fierce wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. It's a picture of destruction, isn't it? If the Christians in this group are the flock of sheep, and the wolf comes in, several wolves come in, what do they do? They have a big banquet. <laughs> they eat the sheep. So Paul gives a very strong image. And then he says, from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Wait a minute, Paul, I thought you chose these elders. He did. And then he's speaking to the elders only here in Acts 20. And he says, from among you men whom I have chosen to be leaders will arise men speaking twisted things. So many times in the history of the church, it is genuine believers who begin to lead the church astray. They get caught up in some false teaching. In other places, Paul said that false doctrine threatened the gospel itself. In Galatia, he said some were preaching a different gospel and they should be accursed. And then Paul told Timothy, Again in Ephesus, he's writing to Timothy, again in the city of Ephesus where he had spent so much time and he had a large growing church. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, sound words, teaching. He is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicion, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. These are false teachers imagining that godliness is a means of gain. And he said this irreverent babble will lead people into more and more ungodliness. Peter warned of false teachers. False prophets arose among the people. That's the Old Testament people. Just as there will be false teachers among you 
who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. This isn't just innocent ideas, destructive heresies. Even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. 1 Timothy 4.1. The Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Well, <clears throat> even, <clears throat> excuse me, even while the apostles were alive, they knew that there would be destructive, harmful, dangerous teachings that would come into the churches. And so we have to be aware of that today. Number two, not only is false teaching harmful, but if it is not stopped, it spreads and does more and more damage. Sometimes I find myself reading a book by someone promoting a new false teaching, and I think, well, that's wrong. That's not persuasive. That's a stupid argument. No one is going to agree with this. And then I find students agreeing with it. <laughs> because I think, and this can happen to you, as a leader, you've been reading the Bible for many years and you see why something is wrong, but younger Christians don't see, they don't understand so quickly. And in fact, they can be swept away. So Paul warns what happens. Your boasting is not good. This is a sexual morality question, a man living with his father's wife. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? In other words, if you don't discipline this man, others are going to engage in sexual immorality as well. You must be careful to stop what is going on or it will be imitated by others. And here's false teaching in 2 Timothy 2.17. Their talk will spread like gangrene. Do you know, that's an uncommon English word. Do you know what gangrene is? It's a poisoning in your blood and it creeps inside of your body silently and then you die. Their talk will, it's, it's how it spreads. And here's another picture. Um, among, oh no, the examples, among whom are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying the resurrection has already happened. So it's like leaven or yeast that spreads through the lump of bread dough, quietly, silently, but thoroughly. Or it's like gangrene that spreads through your body, harming the body and making the whole body sick and near to death. So it's dangerous. And if one teacher is allowed with this false view, others cannot be stopped. I heard just this week, I heard in one of the European countries that someone who had a very liberal doctrinal view was hired at a seminary. And then pretty soon his friends get hired as well and others come in and, if, and you say, and so I can't use, I, I'm gonna imagine. Here's false teacher Jacob. And he's in the faculty. And then someone says, Jacob says, why don't you hire my friend Peter? And we say, well, he, he teaches this false doctrine. Well, I teach the false doctrine. Don't you, want, don't you like me? Why don't you want me here? And so once one person is allowed in, then he becomes an argument for more and more. My own alma mater, Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, a few years ago, had a professor named Peter Enns, E-N-N-S. And he was denying the factual truthfulness of much of the Old Testament narrative, saying it's, it's myth, it's culturally conditioned, we don't have to believe it as factually true. And then other professors began to support his view and it was, thankfully, the board took a stand and would not renew his contract and he was dismissed. But if they hadn't taken a stand, it would have been impossible to spread like a little leaven, leavening the whole lump. So there's a danger that more will be welcomed in. And they're fierce wolves, not sparing the flock. The longer the wolves stay, the more damage they will do. Paul does not encourage us to say, um, oh, the sheep will see the problem and they'll have a nice dialogue with the wolf and they'll come to a new understanding. No, they're out to harm and destroy. Many leaders of false teaching have been genuine believers who were deceived by a wrong idea. I first wrote this outline in connection with an organization in the United States. 
called the ETS, Evangelical Theological Society. And in the ETS, we only had two doctrinal requirements, inerrancy of the scripture and two, the Trinity. And then within the ETS, some members began to write saying that God doesn't know future human choices. It's called open theism. The idea that God is open to the future. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He does not know what you are going to have for breakfast tomorrow if you're going to have a hard-boiled egg or yogurt because you haven't decided. And God can't know what you have. So the people who were promoting this were Greg Boyd, Clark, Clark Pinnock and John three of them they were writing to promote this view and the rules of the ETS say you can't bring accusations or charges against a member unless it's on the basis of something he has written not just on the basis of something you heard him say in conversation so it was it was careful but they had published supporting this view that God doesn't know the future. And people would ask them, well, are you saying God is not omniscient? He's not all-knowing. Oh, yes, we believe God is omniscient. He just knows all that can be known, but the future can't be known. So they redefine omniscience. And one of the old, probably the oldest member of the ETS, a professor named Roger Nicole, French-American professor, rose in the business meeting and brought charges against these three men saying they shouldn't be allowed in our organization anymore. We want an investigation. And it was a two-step process. You had to get 50% vote of the members to refer it to the executive committee. <clears throat> and then the executive committee would examine the case for a year and bring a recommendation. And then, so you had 50% to refer and 67% to exclude, to kick them out of the organization. Well, there was a vote of more than 50% to refer it to the executive committee. At that time, I was on the executive committee. There were seven of us, or maybe eight. And so we read these writings, and then we invited Clark Pinnock, John Sanders, and Greg Boyd to meet with us. What happened? Greg Boyd did not pay his dues for the next year. And so he dropped out. That was an easy solution. But John Sanders and Clark Pinnock said, no, we believe in the inerrancy of the Bible and we believe in the Trinity. You have to keep us in. Hmm. What to do? We invited them to a meeting. And we invited Roger Nicole, who had brought the charges, to a meeting. And Roger Nicole brought another professor, Bruce Ware, with him. And Clark, San Clark Pinnock and John Sanders came, and we talked with them for nine hours at the conference room at a hotel near O'Hare Airport in Chicago. And then after that, we talked uh, probably another two or three or four hours to know what to do to make a resolution. But afterward, Clark Pinnock and John Sanders said, we think this process has been very fair. We think you were not just trying to accuse us, you were trying to understand. And so we were glad that they thought it was a fair process and that it, they were listened to. In the course of the meeting, John, you know, Clark Pinnock said, 
he had said Jesus was wrong when he predicted not one stone will be left on another. And we said, well, maybe Jesus was right and you're just not understanding the words correctly. How can you say that Jesus was wrong? And he said, okay, I agree with you. I will send a correction to the publisher of this book, so I'll change my mind on this point and maybe on one or two other points. So the points where we thought he was denying the truthfulness of Scripture, he backed off. And so we didn't recommend to the membership that he be excluded. But John Sanders said, I'm not going to change anything I've written. And we said, what about all these predictions of the Messiah being born in Bethlehem and born of a virgin and um, all the predictions of Jesus' crucifixion? Think of how that depends on the choices of Caesar Augustus and Joseph and Mary and the Roman soldiers and Pontius Pilate. All these human choices, how could God know all that in advance? And he's buried with a rich man in his death, Joseph of Arimathea. So many, and John Sanders, in fancy language, but he basically said, this is a good guess by God because he knows human beings' hearts. So on that basis, we recommended that he be excluded from membership. Oh, yes. I think the recommendation was seven to two. I think there were nine of us. Because two of the executive committee members who were professors at other institutions, they said, we think he's wrong, but it's not serious enough to kick him out. So, okay. Everybody disagreed with him, but the question was a judgment call. How serious a mistake is this? Okay. So we brought a divided recommendation to the membership. And I don't know, there were four or five or 600 voting members there, maybe 700, I don't know. And we needed 67 to exclude him. The vote to exclude John Sanders was 62 plus percent. It wasn't 67. Huh. So he stayed in. But do you feel very welcome at an organization where 62% of the members want to kick you out? Some people were saying, this is the end of the ETS. We made a bad decision. We should have kicked him out. But I wasn't so worried because he was marginalized. Almost everyone disagreed with him, and we publicly took the, ba the brave step of voting against him. And, and let me say, this isn't like a church where there are a whole bunch of doctrinal standards. We have Baptists and Pentecostals and Lutherans and Presbyterians. We have Calvinists and Arminians. We have Cal Complementarians and Egalitarians. We have um, Premillennialists and Postmillennialists and Amillennialists. And, we have people who believe in elder government and deacon. There are all sorts of differences in the ETS. Just on the basis of inerrancy in the Trinity, we get together to discuss things. So we don't have an atmosphere of wanting to exclude people if they believe the Bible. But many people over time were increasingly saying, this is not a little thing. This is different from the God of the Bible. And in fact, one PhD student that I had at Trinity counted over 2,000 predictions in the Bible where God predicted something that a human being would do. 2,000, 2,000. It's throughout the Bible. And Bruce Ware, theology professor, made this marvelous speech at the ETS. He was given a whole hour to interact with Sanders, and Sanders was given an hour. And Bruce Ware said, if God doesn't know the future, how can you pray for guidance? Because he doesn't know what's going to happen. How can you trust him that he'll lead you in the right way? And how can he know that your, his, his purposes for you will work out for good if he doesn't know how events are going to turn out? This is a different God. This isn't a minor issue. So people began to understand it was more and more important. Well, I just realized, I just, and, and, and what happened to John Sanders is his college, Huntington College, Within the next year or so, I read in a magazine, Huntington College announces that John Sanders is no longer a member of their faculty. He's been dismissed. 
the president said there was too much trouble. <laughs> and the people who supported the college just said, this is too much. So it was a process. But now, I mention that to say it's a messy process, but it's what Protestants do. Protestantism, the future of Protestantism is determined by thousands, tens of thousands of individual decisions like this in your church, in your organization, where you make a boundary decision about a new issue. That open theism wasn't in the Nicene Creed, it wasn't in the Apostles' Creed, it wasn't a major controversy earlier in the ETS, and it wasn't in our statement of faith, but we had to make a decision. Is that making sense? And the future of the ETS was saved in a healthy way. And so Westminster Seminary's future was saved when it excluded Peter Enns by deny, because he denied much of the historicity of the Old Testament. Other organizations decide to keep these people and the organization becomes more and more broad and the boundaries aren't protected. So, hmm, it's important. Greg Boyd, incidentally, <clears throat> was a teacher at Bethel College in St. Paul, Minnesota. And the college said officially, we don't agree with Greg Boyd, but we think he has academic freedom to teach this. So they decided to keep him and they defended him against accusations for two or three years or four years. And then he left to become a full-time pastor. <clears throat> and I saw the letter that the president of Bethel College sent out concerning Greg Boyd he said, we're sorry to see Greg Boyd go. He's been a wonderful colleague. He's an excellent teacher. Students love him. He's uh, been a friend of uh, many here at, this, at the college, and we think, we're thankful for his wonderful contributions to the college, and we wish him well in his new work as this full-time pastor. P.S. We will never again interview or hire anybody who holds to open theism. <laughs> This is how the church protects itself, in a process, in boundary decisions. The opposite of that is the Roman Catholic Church, where the pope decides, or the pope and the bishops decide. We don't have that, we don't want that. It centralizes authority in a way that the New Testament does not justify. We have a messy process, but it's a good process, and we hope it's a fair process. Okay, so now it's necessary. Now, I haven't yet said which teachings have to be stopped. <clears throat> I'll come to that at the end, okay? If false teaching is not stopped, we will waste time and energy in endless controversies rather than doing valuable kingdom work. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know, they breed quarrels. Avoid foolish controversies. <clears throat> They're unprofitable and worthless. I know some people who have been pastors in liberal denominations, and maybe God calls them to that for a time. But after a while, some of them say, I'm wasting so much time arguing with fellow pastors, it's not doing kingdom work, and then they leave. So that's a judgment that every person has to make. I don't know what God is calling each person to do. Jesus and the New Testament authors hold church leaders responsible for silencing false teaching. The New Testament is not silent on this issue. Many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, suppose the circumcision party that say to be saved you have to be, believe in Christ and be circumcised if you're a male. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. There isn't a passivity regarding harmful false teaching. And then Revelation 2.14, Jesus says, I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. So they might, so there, we don't understand fully what this false teaching was, but Jesus has that against the church at Pergamum, that they had them who held this teaching and they didn't take care of disciplining them. And another one, you have this, I have this against you. This is Revelation 2.20, 2.20, Thyatira, I have this against you, you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching 
and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food offered to idols. My goodness, is this relevant for people who say that same-sex relationships or same-sex marriage is legitimate? Jesus said, if you allow people who teach this in your church at Thyatira, I have it against you. I'm holding this against you. Jesus holds them responsible. Some people object. Doctrinal boundary, oh, we don't, what good does a piece of paper do? A doctrinal boundary won't do any good. People will say they agree with it and they really don't. Well, my response is a doctrinal statement or a doctrinal boundary doesn't solve every problem, but doctrinal boundaries do prevent some people from joining because they read it and they say, well, you believe in the resurrection of Christ. I don't, so I won't join. Or they give some people, another reason is they give some people opportunity to admit honest differences. And they give leaders, a this is very important, they give leaders a standard for choosing new leaders or disciplining those who do not agree. This was the difficulty in the ETS. We didn't have anything about God knowing the future in our doctrinal statement, so it was a very difficult question. And if you have a doctrinal statement that includes what you think is important, then you have a basis for saying, well, this person doesn't agree with it. We can't let him or her continue in any leadership role. Now, the question is, why not just, I, I've heard some people say, why do we need new boundaries? Why not just use the, West, or the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed and maybe the Chalcedonian Confession? Why draw new boundaries? By new boundaries, I mean stating explicitly what you believed all along, but never stated in your doctrinal boundary. I think the doctrinal boundary, a new boundary is not to make your organization different, but it's to keep it from becoming different. So um, new is stating publicly for the first time what the vast majority of members have assumed to be true from the beginning. Not to make an organization different from what it was, but to keep it from becoming different. Many Christian groups and many churches in the United States are adding a statement of human sexual conduct to their policy or their beliefs, including that sexual intimacy or sexual intercourse is only a, to be done, be, only, is only right, is only right within the context of marriage between one man and one woman. Because we have all sorts of challenges from the outside today and people say, well, we come to your church and we want to be married to men. Well, there's nothing in your doctrinal statement that says anything about that. Well, that's why we've been revising doctrinal statements, because not to make us believe something different from what we always believed, but to say explicitly what we have already believed so that we won't become different. Okay? I think that's important. False teaching changes so old boundaries do not protect against new problems. So let me mention some things. What are the false teachings that are confronted in the New Testament? Requiring circumcision, saying that the resurrection is past already, saying that the dead are not raised, worshiping angels, forbidding marriage, forbidding certain foods, and some other things. Docetism, proto-Gnosticism. But then we come to later examples, the Nicene Creed in 321, or 325 and 381 AD addressed the full deity of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That wasn't explicitly addressed before. And then in the Chalcedonian Creed or Chalcedonian Affirmation in 451 AD, there was the unity of the divine and human nature of Christ in one person. That wasn't a problem earlier, but it was aff affirmed then. And then the Reformation, we got new teachings that were being affirmed that weren't in the earlier creeds. We got justification by faith alone, addressing the problems of purgatory, indulgences, denial of sola scriptura or the Bible alone and the priesthood of all believers, and many other things. In the 20th century, 
The question of the inerrancy of the Bible was addressed more clearly than ever before because it was a, an ongoing controversy. In recent years, other things. Denial of substitutionary atonement by Joel Green in the United States and Steve Chalk in the United Kingdom. Um, and other things recently. So false teaching changes. The serious false teaching changes. And so from time to time, not often perhaps, but from time to time, I think we need to write new boundary statements or add to our boundary statements. Why does God in his sovereignty allow these various false teachings to come into the church? Partly for the purification of the church, he's sanctifying the church through history and in controversy we learn, in the controversy of the Trinity, the church learned more about the doctrine of the Trinity. In the controversy about the person of Christ, the church learned more. In the controversies of the Reformation, the church learned in more depth about justification by faith alone. So part of its purification, and this happens gradually over time. Also, God, I think, allows attractive or tempting false teachings into the church from time to time to test our faithfulness. To test our faithfulness. I think there will always be things that God asks us to believe, not logical contradictions, but mysteries, paradoxes that we cannot fully explain. God allowed, if a prophet, this warning in Deuteronomy 13, if a prophet or dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder and the sign or wonder comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of the prophet or the dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you. He's testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So he would allow these false prophets, even sometimes with predictions that came true. But if they were saying, let us go serve other gods, God was testing them. And I think from time to time, God allows some false teachings to be popular and he asks us to believe things that we don't fully understand. The doctrine of the Trinity, there's no logical contradiction, but it's a mystery. There's a paradox there. How can God be three persons but one being? God's sovereignty and human responsibility, there are things we don't understand. And there are things that God asks us to believe that are not logically contradictory and not evil things about God, but things that are emotionally hard for us to receive, like the doctrine of hell or the impossibility of salvation without hearing about Christ. Those are emotionally challenging to believe, but the Bible teaches them. The question is, will we believe these things, not because we can explain them fully, not because we can say we enjoy these things and delight in them, the doctrine of hell or the lost, who haven't heard of Christ, but simply because God's word teaches them and we submit to his word, and we submit to his word in its entirety. We stand under God's word and subject to it in all that it teaches and all that it says. And then I think God allows false teaching sometimes to test our attitudes toward false teachers. Francis Schaeffer said, a number of years ago, he was involved in a split in the Presbyterian Church in the United States. He said, at the same time, we must show forth the love of God to those with whom we differ. 35 years ago in the Presbyterian crisis in the United States, we forgot that. We did not speak with love about those with whom we differed and we have been paying a high price for it ever since. We did not talk of the need to show love as we stood against liberalism. And as the church, the Presbyterian Church was lost, that lack has cost us dearly. So even though we disagree with people who are teaching false things contrary to scripture, we need to act with love and Christian charity toward them. And God tests our hearts in that way too. We should, must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently correcting evil, correcting his opponents with, enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. 
When should evangelical organizations draw new boundaries? I want to hurry here because I want to allow some time for discussion. After false teaching has become a significant problem, but before it does great harm and has a har large following entrenched in the church. In the United States, the Presbyterian Church USA didn't draw boundaries soon enough, and now it's endorsing homosexual pastors and denying the, uh, and people who deny major doctrines are allowed to be pastors in the church. United Methodist Church, the same. It didn't deny, it didn't draw boundaries soon enough, and it was lost. But who has the authority to add to the doctrinal statement? Who has the authority to make these changes? Not the Pope. We don't have a Pope. And there are no church councils today, but hundreds of thousands of churches and organizations gradually come to a consensus over an issue. So I was at a conversation here at the European Leadership Forum this year with someone who has influence in the leadership of a Christian organization. And we were talking about, and we were talking about an issue of relationship to Roman Catholics and trying to understand what would be wise policy in that regard. And afterward I said, to, we had a wonderful conversation, and afterward I said to him, the history of Protestantism in the world is determined by conversations like this. As people reason and think and ponder and seek God's wisdom together and then decide this will be our policy, this will not be our policy. That's how Protestantism decides its future. So when you are involved in a, con in a decision about a boundary in your church, in your parachurch organization, your uh, youth ministry, your publishing house, when you are involved in those conversations, these are very important. It's how the future of Protestantism is determined by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of individual organizations making decisions. Now the end. For what issues, for what doctrinal and ethical matters should we draw new boundaries? I'm not giving you a list. I'm saying ask six questions. Number one, how certain are you that the teaching is wrong? Over time, people began to be more and more certain that open theism was wrong. Number two, what, are the, what is the effect on other doctrines? If you deny inerrancy, if you deny the Trinity, it affects many other doctrines. And I'm going to say something a little controversial here. I don't think differences over spiritual gifts have much effect on other doctrines. It's not like inerrancy or the Trinity. You can disagree with me if you wish. What is the effect on personal and church life? Personal and church life. Now, um, there is a teaching that of universalism or inclusivism, that everybody is saved even if they don't hear about Christ. That has a major effect on our Christian lives because it affects evangelism and missions. So I think that's significant for that reason. What is the historical precedent? Is this teaching contrary to the vast majority of the Bible-believing church throughout history? Uh, open theism was contrary to almost the whole history of the church. It had a very few uh, isolated supporters, but very few. Then five, what is the perception of importance among God's people? Is there increasing consensus that this matter is important enough that the teaching should be explicitly denied in the doctrinal statement? God's people over time will gain an increasing consensus and then the purposes of the organization is a significant threat to the nature and purposes of the organization. Um, here, um, for the ETS, different views on baptism didn't make any difference at all. That's not the purpose of the organization. But for a Baptist church to allow different views on baptism, that would change the purposes of the organization. I would not recommend that. <laughs> And uh, so, I mean, that's, that's just a, a test case. What are the motivations of the advocates? 
Does it seem that the advocates hold it because of a fundamental refusal to be subject to the authority of God's word rather than because of sincerely held differences of interpretation based on accepted hermeneutical standards? Now you say, well, you can't judge people's motives. You don't know people's heart. But let me tell you, if I talk with you for 15 or 20 minutes about a doctrinal issue, I get a sense for where your heart is, if it's going to be subject to scripture or not. And I think it's good to ask that question. And often, oh yes, Paul said false brothers secretly brought in. He thought their motive was to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ so they might bring us into slavery. He did talk about their motive. And then the methods of the advocates. Do the advocates frequently manifest arrogance, deception, unrighteous anger, slander, and falsehood rather than humility, openness, and correction to reason? The wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Um, sometimes the motivation, the advocates will just be angry and belligerent, and you say, this is not the wisdom that comes from above. So those are the eight questions to ask. Wrong questions, are they my friends? Are they nice people? Will we lose money? Will we lose members? Will the academic community criticize us as being narrow-minded? Will someone take us to court? These are grounded in fear of man, and they're not good reasons. They're not grounded in fear of God. Conclusion, we need to draw boundaries and be wise in how we draw boundaries. We do not want to be like this. Isaiah 56.10, the watchmen of Israel are blind. They are all without knowledge. They are all silent dogs. They cannot bark, dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. What good is a watchdog who can't bark? <laughs> we don't want to be that way. And God has made us watchdogs often in our churches and organizations.